Hey, thanks for tuning into the Long Great Lesson Show. It's a podcast that motivates and inspires leaders to pursue their passions and to leave a positive impact in their communities. Welcome to episode four of the Long Gray Lesson Show. It's such a privilege to have you here today, Mike. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me, sir. Absolutely. So please tell me what you're doing here. So we're at Second Aviation Detachment here at Stewart International Airport. Um, about three weeks out from my change of command after being assigned here for three years as a commander. And in conjunction with that change of command will also be my retirement after 29 years and seven months. That's incredible. 29 years and just a couple weeks. How are you feeling from making that transition? Uh, I'd be lying to you if I told you there wasn't quite a bit of uh, anxiousness and, and apprehension involved. Um, not because I don't have anything in solid footing in the civilian world, but just because I, I enjoy the service. It's been the only institution I've known for my entire adult life since I was 18. So it's uh, just a little bit of sad and leaving it, I guess, because I know there's neat stuff out there, but I just know it'll never be the same. And I guess just kind of talking about service and talking about majority of your time being spent in the military, um, how, did, how did that all start? How did that, how did that come to fruition? It really started uh, when I was a kid. I grew up in an aviation family, and uh, my dad actually had a, a World War II airplane, a 1942 Boeing Stearman. Um, so it really started through learning, starting with the history of World War II that was associated with the airplane. Um, when I was young, I flew in it for the first time when I was five. And so just from the aviation part of it, just kind of spun off into World War II history, which then kind of forces you to learn about American history, which then sort of segues into, you know, what, what type of Americans served in World War II and then Korea and Vietnam and so on. So I was kind of inundated with that. just by virtue of the catalyst of the airplane. And through that, I don't ever remember a time that I thought about being anything other than in the military from age seven or eight on. I didn't know exactly what I was gonna do. I mean, no grade schooler has that kind of wherewithal, but all I ever wanted to do was wear a uniform and be in the military. And then as I got older, that just kind of got shaped by what my interests were. Did you have um, anyone in your family that was in the military? Uh, so my dad, who is considerably older than your average dad at that time. He was actually enlisted in the Navy in World War II, um, but I had several uncles that had also been in World War II, Korea. Um, and so with that, all of his friends and their friends were all, you know, veterans because that was the era. Everyone served in, during that era. So uh, I was surrounded with it quite a bit. And of course, being from a small farm town, very patriotic. It was something that was, you know, thought of as a, as a noble profession and something that every man should probably go do some point in their life. Um, so it, it wasn't a stretch, it wasn't anything that I had to pursue all by myself. And did you do anything prior to actually enlisting? Did you do Civil Air Patrol? Did you... I did. Uh, I was actually a complete Civil Air Patrol uh, sellout. Uh, I loved Civil Air Patrol because that was the only taste of the military I could get in this little town. Sure. Um, and kind of fast forwarding, but my dad passed away when I was 12, so I sort of lost, you know, uh, the airplane was sold, so I lost any connection with aviation. So. Mm. You know, we, we really didn't have a lot of money, so there wasn't, like I was taking flying lessons or, or anything like that. There wasn't any disposable income. So Civil Air Patrol was my only outlet to, one, have some sort of insight into whether or not I liked the military, and two, you know, I could, for a 12 or 14-year-old kid, I got to fly on some pretty neat airplanes. I mean, I distinctly remember sitting on a KC-135, you know, watching them tank A-7s somewhere in Illinois or Iowa, you know, flying on a Huey and a couple other different airplanes. So, I mean, it, it was a pretty neat experience. So how did you continue to, to uh, develop that passion for aviation in the military after Civil Air Patrol? Uh, so interestingly enough, there was a several year block there where I almost completely screwed myself. Uh, like everyone else, I, as I got older into high school, um, you know, I didn't have a fatherly influence that was into aviation. So I tried to pursue it a little bit on my own, but you know, with no money, no influence, no guidance. Um, so I got deeply vested in girls and sports and completely forgot about, you know, aviation and uh, I did have aspirations of going to the Naval Academy um, probably mainly inspired by the fact that I was a product of the Top Gun era um, but I never flew you know I kind of got out of Civil Air Patrol um, was a pretty decent football player you know ended up going to, to college to play football so then I thought well perhaps you know maybe this is where my my passion and talent talent lays um, one semester in a division one program told me quite clearly that I was not <laughs> that was not where my talent was. 
once you hit a roadblock and you fail at something, you instinctively go back to what you're good at or what you enjoy, um, which is kind of a, a safe haven. And for me, it was the military and aviation. So, so I, I left that prestigious university after at Christmas at one semester when they asked me to leave and uh, went and finished that, that year out at a community college that my mom taught at because it was convenient. And uh, as before that last class was finished, I just went down to the Navy recruiter and, and enlisted in the Navy. Fast forward through everything else, a year later, I was not on the deck of a nuclear aircraft carrier launching off the catapult. I was a, a crew chief on a CH-46 helicopter uh, stationed in Guam, which is pretty traumatic for a kid from a farm town. It's an island, right? It's an island. It's like 14 by 32 mile oh island. Beautiful, beautiful place, but it's not what I had, had envisioned and uh, turned out to be one of the, the more broadening experiences of my life. But uh, so I was a crew chief on a CH-46 helicopter in the Persian Gulf in Desert Storm. Um, you know, delivering, very unceremoniously delivering mail and pallets of cheese balls and sodas back and forth from the supply ship to the carrier. So somewhere in there, about a year and a half into that tour in Guam, I mean, I knew about Navy SEALs and all that, but I was still not a super athlete. I mean, I'd gotten to the point where I was actually a pretty good athlete, taught myself how to swim. Obviously, to be a helicopter rescue swimmer, yeah. you had to have some aptitude for it. Right. Um, so I spent a decent amount of time in the water, and, and I had kind of mastered that. I was sort of the what I considered the the pinnacle of my craft in that. It's just not that complex. Um, and then one day this 46 lands on our ramp and these guys with big muscles and, you know, ironically shaggy blonde hair, you know, <laughs> they come off wearing tank tops and UDTs and, and I'm like, who are those guys, you know? And somebody said, oh, those guys are Navy SEALs. And contrary to kind of what people hear today, you know, there's movies and books. There was nothing about them out that there was very, very little except for some of their service in Vietnam. There wasn't anything, there. There wasn't any internet, you know, there was, there was no available material you could read on it and it wasn't inundated by the press. So nobody really knew what they did except nobody knew what they did. And that was the mystique right there. That's all I needed. Wow. That and they had long hair and they weren't wearing uniforms. Short sandals. Short, big muscles, you know, all that. I'm like, so I distinctly tell somebody, well, I don't know what they do, but I want that job. And the next morning, you know, cause it was a long duty day. That next morning I walked up to the career counselor and said, hey, I wanna be a Navy SEAL. You know, I did another deployment after that on a ship uh, with the helicopters, but I got orders to BUDS. And then uh, summer, well, that spring, uh, reported to a basic underwater demolition school in San Diego. When you got to that point then, you're at BUDS, it's like you're at the go big or go home? Like you have Yeah, to so funny part is I had nowhere else to go. And uh, to my detriment, I thought I was pretty good. I thought I was in great shape. You know, everybody who shows up at BUDS thinks they're gonna be a SEAL at the end of that six months. Um, so I thought I was, I thought I was pretty badass, you know, I'm, I'm like, this is, I'm going to smoke this. Well, it took about two days into that when I'm like, I don't think I got what it takes. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I am not the guy I thought I was. Um, and that's kind of by design and training, but we started out with 170 or 180, uh, guys in the class and we graduated 19 or 22, something like that after six months. Wow. Um, so quite an attrition rate, but I was pretty sure that I was not going to make it to the end. So very humbling. Um, there are guys that, you know, never ever have quit in their mind, but every single day for me, you know, it was a gut check. I was pretty sure I wasn't gonna make it to the end of the day. Um, one of my techniques that I always tell people, they're like, well, how'd you make it? I'm like, well, I don't know how other people made it, but I knew that I was a slow runner. I was a decent swimmer. I probably wasn't as, you know, mentally strong as, as other guys in the class. I mean, there's Olympic swimmers and, you know, Naval Academy, Division one athletes. I mean, there's the whole scope of, of people that are truly athletically prepared for that kind of training. I was not. I just swam in the pool at Guam and, you know, ran up and down coral roads, um, did some push ups. So I tell them, like, I just did meal to meal because my brain could not conceptualize completing six months of that. I couldn't even go a month. I couldn't even go to the end of the week. So I would get up at, you know, whatever it was, 4 35 in the morning. And I know, well, breakfast is at 6.30. So whatever they got for me between now and then, I'm just going to get to breakfast. And I know when I get to breakfast, I'll get half an hour to kind of reset and uh, you know, get my mind right, get warm. And I know lunch is around 11.30. I don't even need to watch. It's training. So I know they have to feed me. And so I would just go to lunch. And then from lunchtime, I'd make it to dinner because I knew dinner was at 5.30. And then, you know, pretty much after that, they left you alone and you got to go back to the barracks. And I kind of made a ritual of it. Every single day that I walked back to the barracks, I stood there in front of this barracks there on the beach at Buds, hearing the waves crash and shivering because you're freezing and all that. And I'd stand there, I'd say to myself, you know, day number 18, 
and I'm still here. And I did that every single day, you know, whatever it was, day 215, and I'm still here. Um, and I did that all the way for, for the entire length of training. Um, and that just happened to be my personal personal method of, of taking it. So that's my technique, meal to meal. And 25 I use, meter target. Yep. Meter target. I call it meal to meal because I like to eat, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but it is, it is a 25 meter target. So you complete BUDS and you receive orders. What's your first assignment? So my first assignment was uh, SEAL Team 1 there in Coronado, which was about 40 yards away from BUDS. Um, and I had no I had no reason to ask specific because I didn't know really anything about the teams. I didn't know the difference between SEAL Team 1, 3, 5. All I knew was uh, the girl who I was trying to marry was in college in San Diego. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, all right, well, I want to want to go to Norfolk because, you know, that'll, that'll end this in short order. Sure. So that was one reason. And the second reason I picked SEAL Team 1 was because one of the very few bits of literature available was a historical fictional novel by a gentleman named Dick Couch, and it was called SEAL Team 1. And it was based on real people, the events were real people, but, it, you know, fictitious characters. And so I read that during my deployments, read it a couple times, and it, you know, had, it was very graphic into the guys going through BUDS and what their life was like in the teams through Vietnam and all that. So I'm like, well, if it's good enough for a book, you know, then you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to SEAL Team 1. I got I to have to see what this is like. And so during that nine year time frame, what were, um, what were some of the challenges that you faced going through there? Uh, the biggest challenges are once you get there, um, you go through another six months called SEAL qualification training at the time. It's called SEAL tactical training now, but so you still didn't have your trident. So there's nothing worse than being at a SEAL team and not, not wearing a trident because you're not really a SEAL. You're really a probationary status. Um, so it's kind of a miserable existence because they put you into a platoon that's getting ready to deploy, that's a year from deploying, and you do a year-long workup. So you spend a good six months of your year-long workup not wearing a trident. So it's just kind of a demeaning, kind of a demeaning existence, but you're spending that whole time, you know, proving yourself. Anyway, so at the end of that six months, you know, you get an evaluation from all the senior, the senior SEALs. Um, and you also take a, you know, practical exams on shooting and rigging a parachute. Can you tune up this HF radio? You know, all those, you know, uh, medical trauma. Uh, so at the end of that, you know, all the, the chiefs, E7s and above get together and say, hey, is he going to make it or not? Sort of animal house style. Mm -hmm. And then very ceremoniously, you know, you get presented your trident. And that's actually a pretty emotional experience. It's not, it's not a big thing. Like your family doesn't show up. It's not, you know, it's not a big deal. You just stand on the carpet and the CO pounds it in your chest. But, you know, that's a, that's a long road to earn a piece of metal. Wow. Um, but getting back to challenges. So you're putting this platoon... Um, with guys that have deployed three, four, five times. Um, and your rank in a SEAL team is not based on what you're wearing on your collar. It's referred, you know, it's based on your time on the rock, as they say, or time of the team. So, you know, I was an E5 at the time, and I had E4s that had two or three platoons underneath them that had come straight to the teams and never did any time out in the fleet. Um, they were far more tactically proficient, you know, mature, all that kind of stuff. So, you're, you know, you're basically taking orders um, out of rank. Um, and the same thing, officers get the same thing. I mean, they get a, a median level of respect because they're an officer, but you'll still have E4s, E5s, you know, telling you where to go, when to be there and, and what to do. So um, it's a very high powered, um, tenuous atmosphere because every single thing you do, you're being evaluated because you're brand new. Right. Um, and it's a tough crowd. I mean, you talk about some A-type personalities in a very intolerant atmosphere um, for failure or mediocrity. Mm -hmm. So. Just very stressful, particularly as a new guy. You know, once you get more mature and your skills are kind of honed, it's not quite as, as nerve wracking as you're going through deployment workups. Um, but as a new guy, you know, big challenge. Because again, just like buds, um, you think you're going to fail all the time. Um, you're not set up to fail, but the the standards that which you have to perform are graduated significantly. So that's that's your barrier. Then it's not somebody screwing with you, um, you know, trying to test your resolve. At that point, it's just the training evolutions are so complex and the standards are so high that you're always fighting to make sure you meet the minimum standard, or the expected standard anyway. Were you flying at all during this time frame at all? I was. So I never, what's kind of funny, and you'll probably sense a trend throughout the podcast. So as soon as I got to SEAL teams and I started to get my feet on the ground a little bit, where I think once I got my trident and I wasn't so new and I had a little bit of breathing room, then one day I just kind of wandered out to the airport. Um, you know, I'm like, because, as I said before, when things get hard or, you know, I think at that time I, I may have been a newlywed and 
you know, deployments were tough and I had, I had no hobbies. I had nothing but the team. That's all I had because that's all I ever wanted. So at that point, so I was kind of one dimensional. And so when I needed a mental break, I just went out to the airport and uh, I distinctly remember telling my wife, I'm like, you know, I miss that. I really miss, I miss the airport. That kind of was my happy place. And, you know, when my dad passed away and I sort of walked away from it, it wasn't, you know, when he passed away, it wasn't my happy place anymore. Um, so I sort of found it again. And, uh, and after that, you know, I don't pursue anything passively. So I'm like, well, this is it. I like to fly. I'm going to, so I actually started taking flying lessons again. And, and during the middle of that, you know, I actually finished my private pilot license in between deployments and workups. And I was gone anywhere from seven to nine months out of the year in increments. You know, we did six month deployments at the end of it, but you'd be gone two, three weeks at a time, home for a couple of weeks. So I mean, I was always out at the airport, um, you know, much to the detriment of what my wife deserved at the time to have me home. But she understood that I needed you know, something other than the team. Um, so I started flying and I mean, I spent a lot, spent a lot of money and a lot of time doing it. It's not cheap. Yeah. yeah, it's not cheap. And I, was, <laughs> I ended up being, you know, pretty proficient at it. I enjoyed it. Went through a couple different ratings and multi-engine and all that kind of stuff and uh, started towing gliders. And um, so, I mean, I had a decent amount of experience in a pretty short amount of time. And then I realized at that point that, uh, you know, I thought maybe I'll, I'll still retire as a SEAL, you know, I'll do my 20 and get out. But I realized that my, my future, you know, my passion was still flying. So then September 11th happened and uh, I was deployed to Sri Lanka at the time. So all these plans, you know, of course the airline industry completely disintegrated. Almost every industry in aviation was emaciated for a good chunk of time. So I came back from that deployment, made the quick decision um, after flying with a lot of uh, 160th Special Operations Aviation guys overseas and in training. I'm like, well, that's pretty easy. Um, I can't get into the Navy because I don't have a degree yet. I won't get a Navy flight school, but I can go be an Army warrant officer. So hmm. just like I went and signed on the dotted line for BUDS, you know, I went on this six-month process of that was the only focus I had. You know, the Internet was around, but it was still pretty new at that point. So I found out everything I could possibly find out about the warrant officer program. You know, I mean, I had it all done, lined up my own physicals. But I basically just went through recruiting, the Army recruiting office in San Diego and said, hey, my entire warrant officer packet here is complete. All you need to do is sign it and forward it to HRC. And so from there, um, warrant officer packet accepted. How was that transition for you to... So I was so excited. Um, because I finally get to be a military pilot. I mean, I had spent thousands and thousands of dollars on flying on my own. And, you know, so this is, in realizing it at that point, I'm like, this is actually my lifelong dream. Like I said, earning the Trident was very emotional because it was the most sacrifice. Yeah. But talk about finally getting to do something that, you know, since I was a little kid, all I ever wanted to do was be a military aviator. You know, I didn't know Army, Navy, Air Force, whatever, but I mean, I just wanted to be a military aviator. And so I finally got it. So when I saw that, in the antiquated email, you know, that made all the sounds and popped up. And when I saw my name on that list, you know, I don't get very uh, animated, but I remember skipping around the kitchen and, you know, yelling and, and I just don't get that excited about things. So we packed up, you know, my son was maybe one year, one year old at that time, uh, packed up, left beautiful. We had a house on the beach in Coronado, California and packed up for Enterprise, Alabama in the middle of June. Oh, that's complete opposite spectrum complete opposite <laughs> spectrum um ironically though you know I talk to my wife she will always reflect i think both of us do that that was the most enjoyable to that date you know of our marriage that was the most enjoyable year of our time together mm. um because i was doing what i wanted to do um, much like boot camp right you know you couldn't make fort rucker suck people would complain about it and and you know i would i would come home to her because at that time i was flying a huey which is a completely iconic aircraft um, you know, I said, you know what? I got to fly for four hours today and it didn't cost me a penny. On the Army's dime. Yeah, I said, I, I'm getting paid to fly. Whereas before I was paying $100 an hour or whatever it was, you know, to rent an airplane and go fly. I said, I think I'm stealing from the Army. <laughs> um, and that's the way I felt. You know, I wasn't in charge of anybody. I didn't have any responsibilities. All I had to do was show up at either a classroom or the flight line with whatever knowledge I had to have for that night and fly and that's all i had to do i wasn't in charge of anybody it's just the right place at the right time with the right equipment so that year and it was right out of year you know because they had kind of accelerated the process because of the war going on um, that was a pretty blissful year i didn't mind it at all i liked fort rucker you know people complain about it but just like boot camp you know you can't complain about something you told somebody you'd do anything to go 
go do? So from there, um, first in your class, um, flying Hueys, how did you end up with the 160th? So I knew, I knew before I went to flight school, I mean, and again, very pompous, very uh, um, cocky, I guess, presumptuous that I even had any idea. I'm like, well, I'm a SEAL, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go fly for the 160th. Not knowing that that wasn't the way it went. <laughs> you know, I thought, well, I'm gonna go fly for the 160s because I'd flown the 160th guys a lot. Um, I was kind of a groupie when I was a SEAL teams. When I knew I wanted to fly, I'm like, man, well, if I'm gonna go fly, I wanna go fly black unmarked helicopters and do what they do. And of course, then the movie Black Hawk Down came out and all that, so they kind of came into the limelight. Um, so before I signed up for walk school or before I sent in my warrant officer packet, uh, I actually talked to a, a guy overseas who was flying us, who ended up being the recruiter for the 160th. His name was yeah. CW4, um, Ricky Starr. Ricky. And uh, he's since retired. And I said, well, I want to go to the 160th. He goes, you got to be a warrant officer first. He goes, just give me a call, you know, when you've been selected to the warrant officer program. And so I did call him, and I think he was kind of shocked. I said, well, hey, I just, I just completely trashed a 12-year promising career in the SEAL teams. You know, I'm going to walk school. And he just said, uh, who are you? You know, in my mind, I'm like, please, please remember me. Yeah. Like, please remember me because, you know. And uh, he goes, yeah, hey, just call me when you're done with instruments. So no encouragement, but I'm like, I get to go fly. Anyway, so I was number one in my class, graduated from instruments. I said, hey, I'm, I'm number one in the class. I just finished instruments because that's traditionally where a lot of attrition takes place in flight school. And uh, he said, okay, I'll, I'm going to send you an application packet in the mail again. Nobody emailed anything. It was snail mail, everything. So it showed up at my house, and I had just started. Um, we were getting ready. We had a bubble, like a two- or three-week bubble, getting ready to start what they referred to as uh, Flight School 21. And we were the very first class for that. And he told me over the phone, he said, hey, if we select you, you know you're going to come here and you're going to fly 47s. And I'm like, well, I don't care. I'll fly anything. I mean, reality, like everyone else, I'm like, I want to fly Little Bird gunships or I want to fly Blackhawks or, you know, because that's what was in the movie. Right. Um, anyway, he said, so just so you know, you're going to fly 47s. You don't have to worry about picking. That's what you're going to fly. I'm like, okay, roger that. So end of instruments, we were going to pick our, our go-to-war aircraft, you know, our advanced airframe to do this Flight School 21 thing, which means you did all your basic combat skills in the aircraft that you were going to go on in the Army. So they weren't doing it in OH-58s anymore. So I was number one in the class. Everyone knew that I was applying to 160th. And so they expected me to pick Chinooks because they knew that's where I would end up having to go. So um, again, kind of being a punk, I'm like, no, you know what? I'm gonna take Blackhawks. And of course everybody's you can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I can. Because <laughs> when you're number one, you can pick whatever that's you want. That's right, you gotta choose. So again, that didn't make me pompous or it didn't make me popular. So I picked Blackhawks, started Blackhawks the next week or something like that and uh, finished the course as a Blackhawk pilot. Nice. And uh, like whatever it was, 60 or 70 hours in a Blackhawk. Blackhawk qualified, it's in my records. Never touched one again since 2003. And uh, so there was a, somewhere in the middle of the Blackhawk course, I finished my application for the 160th. You know, the assessment got approved. They sent me down orders to assess. And there's a little story about that too. I didn't really ask anybody at Rucker if I could do that. I sort of did it on my own. Um, much like submitting my warrant officer packet at the SEAL teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, so much of the fact that one of the boxes on there, you know, you got to remember that at that time, the 160th application format was for experienced aviators. It was not set up for someone in flight school with no wings, no experience, no anything. This doesn't so I just, so I just, I just kind of filled out what I knew on there. How much goggle time? Zero. You know, how many deployments? Zero. How many, you know? Oh um, I think I put in a corner, you know, I used to be a Navy SEAL or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, so I finally called the yeah, I finally called the guy up. I'm like, hey, this application's coming. It's not. I said, I don't have a standardization pilot to sign it. He goes, don't worry about it. He goes, but you do need to have your battalion commander sign it. And of course, you know, Fort Rucker is a W1. The battalion commander is like in this castle right. that you're not allowed to tread in. I never, nobody even saw the guy. He's like the Wizard of Oz. And uh, so, but I had to have him sign this. Yeah. And uh, my company commander at B Company of the 45th or whatever it was at Rucker, um, he wouldn't sign it. You know, he wouldn't sign the company commander part of it. And grudgingly, he did. I said, because I'm going to go talk to the battalion commander. He goes, you can't do that. I said, I think I can. I'm pretty sure I can. I mean, right. fortunately, I wasn't a young W1. I had some time behind me. You know, I was fairly mature. And uh, so he grudgingly signed it. And I hand walked it up with my kid at the time, my, my one and a half year old or whatever it was, two year old at the time. <laughs> in civilian clothes because I was out getting ready to out process. Right. 
or something. I can't remember what it was, but I was in civilian clothes. And uh, I walked into his office. He goes, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, sir, I've got an application for the 160th. Um, and they said, I have to have my battalion commander sign it. He goes, I'm not signing that. He goes, you're a W1. I said, I, I know, sir. Um, but right under here, um, I, I called and I told him that you probably wouldn't sign it. And Colonel Torrey, <laughs> who was the regimental commander at the time, Colonel Torrey said, um, if you wouldn't sign it, to call him. So, <laughs> so he took it and looked at it, looked at me. I think having my, my small child with me is the only thing that kept me from getting a shotgun blast to the face. That may have been on purpose. I don't remember at the time. but um, So he signed it and threw it back at me. And uh, so I was very remorseful at the time until I got out his door. And then I skipped down the hallway, you know, put it in the mail, sent it back to the regiment. And then I had orders within a week uh, to go up and assess. So um, that was in the middle of the Black Hawk course. And we had about a three-week or a month-long bubble um, waiting to graduate. So they brought me up and I assessed during that, that bubble. Um, the assessment was a, a very enlightening process. Again, they'd never had a W-1 with no wings. Mm. I mean, they didn't even know what to do with me because I wasn't a rated aviator. Um, I, won't, I won't divulge all the, the fun stuff that goes on at a 160th assessment process. It's pretty straightforward, but it's very demanding. Like the standards are very high. Um, and I didn't get any, they didn't cut me any slack, you know, for being a flight school W-1. Um, I mean, I was judged on the merits and basis of my experience level, um, all the way up to, you know, they even said, hey, we can't gauge you against another 2,000 hour SP or flight leave that's been flying the 101st for five or six years, but you better know every single thing that you've ever learned in flight school and you better be the best flight school student. You know, we're gonna test you all the way up to that, that level. Um, and of course, you know, the only thing that really saved me was I smoked, you know, all the physical stuff. So that was helpful. The swim was pretty comical. They actually, that was pretty pretty humorous at my review at the end by the RCO, because um, I, I think I took that opportunity to sort of be in my element and toy, toy with them in the pool a little bit. <laughs> um, anyway, so at the end of that week, um, you know, whatever it was, 10 or 12 of us that did the assessment, um, we're all standing in this room and they bring you in one by one. And, and I walked in and it goes around the room, every single person that assessed you, you know, the guy who did the PT test, the the psych that did your psychological eval, gave you your IQ test, you know, the doctor who interviewed you, all the way to the flight lead who, the flight lead who gave me my assessment check ride was a gentleman named Carl Meyer. Um, and if anybody are students of Army Aviation History, Carl Meyer's in the Aviation Hall of Fame down at Fort Rucker. Um, at that time, CW5 Carl Meyer. But in 1993, in Mogadishu, a CW3 Carl Meyer flying an MH6 Little Bird. Um, he and another Copilot landed in the streets of Mogadishu, you know, with MP5s and went and pulled the Delta operators out of the wreckage and, and pulled them back. And, you know, he got a silver star for that. And anyway, so Carl Meyer, since retired, obviously, but very understated, quiet, humble guy. So I did my assessment check ride. So if, if you don't think, I mean, talk about the nervousness of, of riding with a, you know, flying with a, a national legend. Um, and again, a pivotal point where the balance of my career is hanging on this hour and a half long flight. Um, but I did very well with it, or did very well on it, you know, at least to my skill level. Got to fly with Carl Meyer. I actually made him sign my logbook, just so I had his name in my logbook. Um, so I walked in, and, you know, everybody went around the room, and, uh, you know, he did this and this and this, and, and they're like, all right, leave. So I go out, and then probably three minutes later, they're like, all right, get back in here. And I go in to stay in attention, and, and Colonel Torrey's like, you know, Mr. Rutledge, um, we usually spend a lot of time deliberating on whether or not you know, we're going to take candidates in the regiment. And uh, this didn't take us very long at all. And of course, in my mind, you know, because I've always got that I've screwed this up thing. Um, I'm like, this is it. Like, how did I screw this? I had one chance, you know, to be a hero and I screwed it up. He goes, this didn't take long at all. And we just want to tell you, welcome to the regiment. And it was like, whew, I mean, that was pretty, that was as emotional as, as getting a trident. Um, you know, and then it was just, you know, rainbows and unicorns at that point. I mean, that was a, that was a big deal. Um, first W1, you know, of that era to be brought in the 160th. But that was pretty big emotional. I mean, I was pretty stressed out about that, obviously, being around all these people that they'd all just gotten back from Afghanistan. And, you know, there was a lot of a heroism in that room. And it was also a pivotal point. That was, that was my career that was in the balance of that. So, so they gave me orders, you know, report back to the 160th, blah, 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 as an MH-47 pilot. Packed up the family, moved everybody up to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, in processed the regiment, and uh, it's getting worse. So as soon as I in processed, 
they knew I was going back down to Rucker to go through the, the Chinook course. So, you know, you, we, at that time we had different flight uniforms with leather patches instead of it just had your name and no positive or whatever. Right. You know, there was no, we had like these little cool assault boots and I had my maroon beret. So I think it was like a week and a half or two weeks after I left Rucker, I came back down wearing, you know, looking like the Night Stalker supply mill van threw up on me. Oh, my God. You know, and so, <laughs> yeah. and that just created mass, you know. It's there. The same folks are still there. And yeah, same folks. There. And they, you know. In fact, I was even in class, you know, in the Schnook class with people that I was in my flight school class with. And so it just keeps getting, it's getting better, you know. Um, but again, keep in mind that I haven't paid any bills at the regiment yet. So this is all, all the fun stuff. Like nothing hard has started yet. Um, but everybody was very cool to me at the regiment. You know, there was no condescending anything. Just, you know, you, you, you made it this far for a reason with all your other peers. So there was, uh, there was uh, none of that W1 stuff, you know, like... You got to remember too. There's a war on, so right now everybody's like, you know what? We would love to beat you and be condescending and all that kind of stuff, but we need to train you up because you need to deploy. Um, and that was kind of the mentality. So, so I went through the Chinook course, graduated as a Chinook pilot now. So I went back up. How many airframes at this point? So at this point, it was a Huey, Blackhawk, and a Chinook. Wow. Yeah. So wow. <laughs> and it gets a little bit better than that. So I went back up, and uh, I was belonged to HHC, I think, and uh, they said, hey. At that time, the 160 was flying uh, MH6 Charlies, which were old V-tail, non-deployable, um, and they just used them for local area proficiency, but they were fun to fly. They also used them for assessment check rides, and uh, they don't have them anymore. But anyway, they said, well, hey, it's going to be six months before your green platoon class starts for the MH47. You know, do you want to go to the MH6 AQC, which is only three weeks long? And of course, I'm like, heck yeah, I do. So whatever it was, three or four weeks later, uh, I graduated in MH6 pilot, you know, and all we do is just fly around Fort Campbell or fly to places for lunch or whatever. And so at that point, I can't remember who I told him, like, you have to be kidding me. So I'm still a W1, six months out of flight school. Um, and I told some, somebody, well, I hadn't even gone to the Chinook course yet. It was a W1 with a Huey, a Blackhawk, CH-47 Delta, and an MH6. This is unheard of. In my records. Yeah, I, I think it has to be somewhere in there you know and again it wasn't wasn't anything i strove for right it was just one of those where somebody says hey do you want to and I'm like yeah absolutely yes. Yes. not even yes. knowing why i would do it or if i'd ever fly it again i've never flew well that actually be was pivotal as well because i ended up flying a, a little bird for the museum as well because i had little bird time um so all these things i didn't see coming so i didn't really get to spend any time flying the mh6 because they're like hey we got a shortfall in this next mh47 aqc so Jumped in it six months later, graduated as an MH 47E pilot, still as a W1. Um, got assigned to uh, uh, B Company 2nd Battalion of the 160th there at Fort Campbell. Um, they had two Chinook companies at that time, A Company and B Company. And uh, they had all just gotten back from Afghanistan, you know, so, and they'd lost several, several guys. And it was rough for A and B Company, um, so they were very focused. And uh, yeah, so then I was a W1 checking into B Company. You know, with a, a Huey, a Blackhawk, CH-47, uh, MH-6, and MH-47 wow. in my records. And usually, is it just one airframe? You just get one aircraft. aircraft. Usually, people spend their entire career flying one helicopter. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, and then fast forward down the line, several years later, I went to the fixed wing course, and I got C-12, and then here at West Point, I got the Cessna 182 and the, and the UH-72 Lakota. Um, so I've got to fly, I've got to fly just about everything except for the Apache. You got to write a book on this about how you were able to get all these different airframes through the army. <laughs> I just tell people you just you just have to say yes. It's all you have to do is you know say yes. Um, so I went across the street to B Company Second Battalion, and uh, at this point, you know everybody's doing sixty on, sixty off because we're fully engaged in the war, um, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. So there really wasn't a whole lot of monkeying around. Somewhere in there, very shortly after I made it to B Company, uh, I pinned on uh, CW two. So at least I didn't have the they didn't know if I was a six-year W-2 or a six-week W-2. So at least that got a little bit of the, the stink off me. But uh, I bet it wasn't 12 or 16 days, something it was, after I graduated Green Platoon, I was on a C-17 headed over to Bagram, Afghanistan, doing my first deployment as wow. a co-pilot. Well, when you do Green Platoon in the 160th, um, unlike progression in a conventional Army unit, the day you graduate, you are readiness level one in that aircraft. You are a qualified co-pilot in all the environments. So. You know, in that six months, I was qualified in the aircraft. We had done air-to-air -air refueling, urban, desert. We'd done deck training. I mean, 
So you were, it's not like you went to your unit and then got progressed, you were progressed. So once you graduate from Green Platoon, you know, you, you are a deployable co-pilot. Did any of your um, personal flying experience assist with that at all? It did a little bit, and I think the MH-47 is such a complex aircraft. Uh, the only reason I survived was I had enough civilian flying experience that I knew how to talk on the radio, you know, I knew airspace, all those things that a brand new flight school student has to figure out when they get to their unit. I mean, I kind of had that, so all I had to do was focus on the intricacies and complexities of, of flying an MH-47, and the, the avionics in an MH-47 are ridiculously complex and multifaceted, so that was that was a steep learning curve. I was always behind the helicopter. It took me about probably three or four years before I stopped being behind the helicopter and being able to kind of look bigger picture than what was right in front of me. So from Green Platoon, um, deployment back to back, what you said it was 60 on? At 60 that time on? we were doing about 60 on, 60 off. Oh, wow. And so when you were home for those 60 days, you weren't home, you were you know, you were at Fort Benning, Georgia, training with the Rangers, or you were at Dam Neck training with the SEALs, or you were, you know, at, at somewhere in Georgia with the Special Tactics guys. Um, so you were always on the road training. Um, you weren't just home. How many deployments did you go on while you were with SOAR? So as a 160th pilot, I did 16 combat deployments. In 13 years? Uh, 13 years. 16 and 13 years. So high op tempo, gone frequently. Constantly. What kept you going? How, how did you have that stamina to just keep? Well, one, after a number of years, it just becomes your life. It becomes your life, becomes your routine, and you forget that there's anything else out there. Um, huge toll on the families. Um, you know, the, the regiment does their best to mitigate that and kind of help people be resilient. But, um, you know, gone seven or eight months out of every year is gone seven or eight months. It doesn't matter if you're in a hotel in Virginia Beach or, um, you know, in a bee hut in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, so you find the missions when you're overseas, and I always tell people about the 160th, is the payoff is not at home training, because that's, that's kind of the, that's not very much fun. Because if you're home, you'd rather be in your own bed. Um, so the payoff is when you go overseas. That's like the big reward. Um, because generally, every single night that you fly, you know, you're, you're facilitating, you know, the nation's most skilled assaulters, um, to make someone bad go away. Right. So every single night you go out, it, it means something. Um, you're not just going out, you know, picking up, um, you know, some bottom feeder, you know, IED maker or something like that. I mean, you're, you're going after the, the top tier criminals um, that we're there for, um, that are having an effect on, on global security. So the deployments are very meaningful. They're hard um, because it's an arduous, arduous op tempo. When we're deployed, we fly almost every single night um, seven days a week, you know, there's no days off. There's no, the only days off we have is when the weather's too bad to fly. So contrary to the way the regular army, they may do a, a year long deployment, um, but they are getting, you know, they'll get weekends off or they get two out of every 10 days off or something like that. They actually get some, some program days off and we don't. That's why our deployments are limited to anywhere from 30 to 60 to 90 days based on the need. Um, it's because that's about as long as you can that's about as long as, as you can handle without hitting chronic fatigue and um, you know all those other bad things that go with going out and doing assaults every single night. Did you get to uh, run into any old friends, people you worked with? Constantly, SEALs? constantly. So you gotta remember from the time I left the SEAL teams to the time I was back in Afghanistan deploying was maybe two years total. Um, so the very first assault I did, uh, a guy who was one of my groomsmen in my wedding popped his head up. You know, he's, he was one of the squadrons, um, the SEAL squadrons off the East Coast, and he popped his head up. And I mean, that was commonplace. So I was always running into guys that, that I was in the SEAL teams with, which is very rewarding. That, that actually added an extra element of, of purpose, you know, for the flying that we did. Any resentment that, they, that you switched over at all on their end? You know, I always thought there would be. I thought I'd be ostracized from the community. Um, but I always got from them, I mean, it sounds funny, but some guys who were senior to me, they were nicer to me when I was a SOAR pilot than I was when I was in the teams. And I always ask, you know, because we'd always, when we were done with the assaults, I'd usually go hang out with them and talk to them, you know, off duty and stuff, just to catch up. And uh, they're like, dude, we're so glad you went over. Like, nothing makes us feel better. Like, even if you suck, even if you're not any better than the guy sitting next to you, which it wasn't. I mean, I, I co-piloted and flew with some legendary pilots, guys that, you know, I'm probably not even qualified to carry their helmet bag, but... Um, we made great crews, 
but just their perception that you know one of one of the brotherhood was was in the cockpit you know you got to imagine when these guys are doing their assaults that they're doing every single night you know high risk assaults any little bit of confidence that they get that it's going to be okay you know is pretty valuable and that's really how they saw it was well if one of our guys is up front it's going to be okay so it was also a lot of pressure to make sure that you know i didn't fail them how did west point come up from there so i actually remember the first time that i ever heard of west point um when i was at second battalion you know a little w2 and i was going through the community managers page on assignments and I don't know why I was on there. Maybe because I think I thought I, well, I, got, I got this licked, you know. We'll see what else I can put on my five-year radar out there. Something to that effect. I'm sure I was, I'm sure I was dreaming big because I always dream way beyond what I'm capable of. And I just saw on there, you know, UH-1, West Point. And I think in my head, I came across that. And I'm like, well, I'm a UH-1 pilot, you know. And I'm like, gosh, how cool would it be to fly at West Point? Knowing nothing of West Point, never been here, hardly ever spent any time on the East Coast, let alone the Northeast. And uh, so I thought, well, how cool would it be, you know, to go to West Point? And then reality set in. I'm like, oh, there's no way I can go to West Point. I'm not anywhere near qualified. You know, there's, I can never gain enough aviation qualifications to, to get to, you know, to get to second aviation at West Point. So out of my head, never paid attention to it again. Uh, so again, fast forward to around 2015, spring of 2015 or summer 2015. Al Mack is the commander of second aviation detachment. And for a very short period of time, like six months, HRC had changed it. And I had just pinned on W-4. And HRC had changed it from a W-5 position to a W-4 position. Wow. And he said, hey, it's no longer nominative. Do you want to come be the commander of second aviation? And I was actually thinking about retiring at that time because I was just strung out and tired. You know, we owned a farm in Washington State, you know, that was almost paid for. And why would we? And so I just instinctively said, something flashed in my head of, you know, 10 years earlier looking at this thing and I'll never make it to West Point, blah, blah, blah. And so I called my wife and said, hey, do you want to go to West Point? Non-deployable, let's just go see. And she's like, okay, let's do it. I mean, in about a 15 minute span, I called Al Mack back and I said, hey, make it happen. Let me know what you need from me. We'll do it. Not having any idea of the complexities of selling our farm, yanking the kids up, moving it across the entire country, you know, all that stuff. Um, so that was it. That's how I got to be the commander of Second Aviation Attachment. And General Kaslin at the time, who was a superintendent, um, he just went up and told General Kazan, hey, this is the guy, you want him, he's going to make second aviation great, you're going to love him, here's his background. General Kazan signed the by name request, you know, and very shortly thereafter, you know, there was some turmoil within HRC because that's not exactly the way it's supposed to go. Um, but when a three-star general, you know, who outranks the HRC commanding general signs a piece of paper, it, it just happens that way. Wow. Um, so I had orders as the commander of second aviation detachment and left the 160th in the summer of 2016, or May of 2016, and reported here, and took command July 1st, 2016. So how's it, how has it changed since being here and actually retiring from here? Well, it has changed me significantly um, because I was an Army aviator and that was my focus. Um, one, being the you know basically a company commander, gives you a much different perspective uh, on leadership and what you're in charge of. So no longer could I just focus on, on being a good pilot. In fact, some of those skills have probably eroded a little bit because I've got other things that I have to focus on. Um, but also the very first thing I did when I was in charge of other people like this is I called up all my previous company commanders. Um, and they laughed because you know now I was in charge of a, a company full of warrant officers and I didn't realize how needy and how painful it was to be in charge of warrant officers <laughs> until you are in charge of them. So, right. so I actually called a couple of my company commanders that I'm still friends with this day. I'm like, hey, sir, just so you know, I'm sorry. He's like, what are you sorry for? I'm, well, I'm just sorry. What, whatever I did to you all those years, I get it now and I apologize. So they always got a good laugh, you know, about that. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. I mean, even in a small detachment, you know, leadership is is hard because it's always towing that line between getting the job done correctly yeah. and then taking care of your people. And it's always an intermeshing of, of that. And it's easy to sway it one way or the other. And anytime you have that out of balance, you know, it's not very long before the, the wheels come off the wagon. Absolutely. And so what sort of involvement do you have here at West Point? What does your job entail? And you're doing some things with the cadets as well? Yeah. So second aviation, um, I'm actually one of the primary pilots here. I'm actually the most experienced pilot here. And that's by design. 
But Second Aviation is busy. You know, we fly the parachute team all the time. Our primary mission is to fly the superintendent, um, executive travel, wherever he needs to go to, to meet his schedule. Um, any other dignitaries or distinguished visitors that come to West Point will routinely fly them in and out of West Point uh, just for ease of transportation. And that's, that's the flying mission of it. We also have like a public outreach mission for Second Aviation. So lots of civic events are held in the hangar, you know, um, General Palm Pressing, kind of the mayor of, mayor of aviation because we're a much more visible outreach on this side of, of the mountain in Newburgh um, than the academy is itself. Most people don't actually make it over to see West Point, but they see the helicopters, you know, with the USMA crest on the side. So, right. so it's a pretty good, pretty good marketing ploy. Part of that is we're allowed to be involved in, you know, as you know, anything that we want at West Point, mm -hmm. kind of whatever you're, you're suited for. So I got heavily involved in the cadet flying team. And uh, since I played football, I was, you know, kind of had the understanding of how to deal with, with young men and motivational, all that kind of stuff. I got pulled in to be one of the uh, ORs for the football team. Um, and then also kind of in different times of the, my period here, also worked with the, the swim team and then the baseball team, which was kind of funny. Um, they're graduating this year, but my baseball players, aviation branch, and I'm like, sure, we need some mentorship. We need you. <laughs> so I don't know anything about baseball. I tell them, like, I can't even play baseball. I suck at baseball. It doesn't matter. So, so I kind of just get, I kind of just get pulled. Um, and part of that is I just really enjoy hanging out with the cadets and um, not as a peer per se, but I think it's very mutually. I, I enjoy their, their energy and their enthusiasm. And I mean, it's a healthy environment to be around. At the same time, you know, I'm able to impart some pretty common sense. 30 years of, of what I did right, right and what I did wrong before they head out the door as lieutenants. From West Point, um, you're retiring soon? I am. How many weeks left? Two and a half weeks left. Two and a half weeks left. Is that in line with graduation as well? Uh, it's actually just a couple days after graduation. Just a couple days after? Four days after graduation. Wow. So what is next from here? So I think everyone expected me to go do something grand. One, everybody expected me to, to take the promotion to CW5 and go on and continue on, you know, be a command chief warrant officer somewhere. And, uh, and I was going to do that. And somewhere along that line, we just decided, you know, 30 years is enough. Um, because in my mind, it doesn't get any better than being commander of the aviation department at West Point. It, it is most definitely a pinnacle assignment for an army warrant officer. It doesn't get any better than this. Um, so for me to go back to an operational unit, you know, I would certainly be contributing to the, the defense of America and all that other stuff. But at the same time, um, I'm not sure anything could match this experience. And I was always afraid when I made that decision, I was just afraid of regretting it. Um, because you're going out on top of the world here and it's the way a career should end. Um, rather than being another four years of deploying and being angry and cynical and wore out and you know, having not seen the family again for half the year. Um, so at that point, it seemed, seemed like the right decision. And like I said, at the beginning of the interview, there's just some anxiousness just because it's, it's a change and a transition. But other than that, we're kind of excited. Um, so for about the last seven years, I mean, like I told you early on, I kind of thought I wanted to be a crop duster. And so I've continued flying as a civilian every chance I've gotten since that point. Um, kind of actually became fairly qualified as a civilian pilot. I've flown several air shows, um, lots of different kinds of airplanes, lots of specialized in World War II airplanes. I own a couple of them now. And uh, so I decided, I think I actually want to try and be a crop duster, which sounds like a really, you know, blue collar kind of dirty job. And it kind of is, but it's also very, very demanding profession and rewarding flying. And I know a lot of guys who will spend a career in aviation in, in the Army or the Air Force or whatever, and they'll walk away and they'll never fly again, or they just do it for a paycheck, um, which amazingly, it's still my passion. So very few people get to do a job in the military that they can just take off their uniform one day and continue to do that job because they're passionate. You know, most people in the military rely on what they call soft skills, you know, leadership, responsibility, organizational management, that kind of stuff, but very few you know, doctors, lawyers, dentists, that kind of stuff. Very, very few of us get to transition, excuse me, transition directly out and do what we love. So um, that's for me. And I, I knew that I did not have the temperament to be an airline pilot or a corporate pilot. You know, I couldn't wear epaulets and, right. and be in a sterile cockpit all day long. Um, so crop dusting and aerial firefighting is much more my speed. I'd prefer to be 
you know, wearing Carhartts and boots and a t-shirt and be sweaty and work on my own airplane um, and be outside. I don't do well in cubicles or offices. So, and the flying is, like I said, the flying is very demanding. It's engaging, you yeah. know, no two days are the same. And you're flying in a single seat airplane, which suits my personality, you know, very well. Sure. It's very rewarding. And the community, you know, you're an agricultural community, which always has kind of America's best people. You know, they are, they are the salt of the earth in those communities. Um, that's where my family and I are, are most comfortable. It's where I'm from. So ironically, I tell people I spent my whole youth trying to get out of rural farm communities. I want to go see the world. And then 20 years into my 30 years, I realized uh, what I really want to do is I really want to get back to, you know, the simplicity of, of rural life. So kind of a, an odd full circle, but that's what, it, that's what it's come to. Right. Um, but then again, you know, you, you should think you go through different phases of your life. That's kind of how you realize you have to have perspective to realize who you really are and where you want to go and, and what makes you happy. Thanks again for the opportunity. It's been such a humbling, humbling privilege to just sit across from you and just kind of go through this journey with you all over again. Thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate you, your time.